Hi, it's Edwin Rutsch from ProgressiveSpirit.com. I'm here at the Albany Library, that's in Albany, California. And tonight is the debate watch party between uh, Joe Biden and Sarah Palin. After the event, there'll be a, a talk by Griffin and George Lakoff talking about their books as well as kind of giving a, a wrap up about the debate. Let's see what happens. Uh, I don't really know what to expect. Um, I'm kind of expecting Sarah Palin to make a fool out of herself, and but then again, Biden has had said some pretty outlandish things, but hopefully he won't make too much of a fool out of himself this time. I, I really have high hopes for this uh, debate. But. They're both very interesting characters, and um, he's. They're, Ten times as intelligent as she is. Yes, he, there's no question that he's much more intelligent, but um, they both have a huge amount of charisma, so it's going to be pretty interesting to see how this plays out. I think Joe Biden will be effective. I think he will be primed to be low key and not to appear to be a bully, and that Palin will do her usual rambling talk, which doesn't really address the issues, and she'll be fairly anecdotal. This debate from behind the couch, sort of peeking around, hoping she does okay. She doesn't have to quote Leo Strauss, but she has to put together full paragraphs, make an argument, uh, and that'll calm some <laughs> American people, Joe Sixpack, hockey moms across the nation, I think we need to band together and say, never again. Never will we be exploited and taken advantage of again, again by those who are managing our money. That has troops in Afghanistan with us now. I find that incredible. <laughs> masters of language in the context of social and political discourse. Um, Susan Griffin is a, an award-winning poet, writer, playwright, and filmmaker. Her 19 books include A Chorus of Stones, which was a finalist for the National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize. Her play Voices earned her an Emmy, and she was also awarded a MacArthur Grant for Peace and International Cooperation. Susan Griffin's new book is entitled Wrestling with the Angel of Democracy on Being an American Citizen. Maxine Hong Houston says, in this compelling book, Griffin shows us that democracy is not something that we can take for granted. We must continually establish it in our hearts and in our society. And I think this is a great thought for us to hold on to although Sarah Palin kind of said something like that at the end of her. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think I like, I like the uh, Maxine Hong Kingston's um, continually establishing it in our hearts and in our society. Um, it's a living thing, certainly. George Lakoff is the Richard and Rhoda Goldman Distinguished Professor of Cognitive Science and Linguistics at UC Berkeley. His early and continuing focus on metaphor as fundamental to how we think and act has evolved into a tool for looking at political values and debate. Lakoff's New York Times bestseller, <coughs> Don't Think of an Elephant, influenced political discourse and critique during the 2004 presidential election and beyond. With his new book, The Political Mind, Why You Can't Understand 21st Century American Politics with an 18th Century Brain, Lakoff <laughs> examines why people vote against their own best interests and why progressive politicians do not successfully communicate their ideas. Howard Dean calls Lakoff one of the most influential thinkers, political thinkers, of the progressive movement. And George Akerlof, Nobel Prize winner in economics, calls Lakoff's approach the most original and the most practical analysis of United States politics in many years. It is my great pleasure to invite Susan Griffin and George Lakoff to make some introdu introductory comments 
and then together to start up tonight's discussion. Um, Um, I was just going to say, if there's an empty seat next to you, maybe you can raise your hand so people without seats can find a seat. And I think we've added a couple benches. Also, the library closes at 9, so we will go no later than 8.40, <coughs> and it's going to ring, in order to have time for you to meet the authors and to purchase books. Okay. So, welcome. Yes. We can go somewhere. Oh, okay. So we will we will go until we we can go until nine, and then we will take time for signings and, and for you to meet our tonight's speakers. Thank you. Welcome. I guess. Uh, can you hear me well? I mean, I find my impulse is to stand, but I guess my doesn't really let me do this. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. 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 I'll stand over here. I won't. I'm not. Gonna, George and I are going to spend most of the evening ask, you know, asking you for questions and responding to them. But, but we'll each do a little five minute sort of uh, opening. And um, th this book that I I wrote, uh, you know, I I just feel like. George and I are in such harmony, you know, with it, with our work recently, and we've always, I've always found him very um, inspiring. But, but this this book is about the inner life of, of democracy, or the psychology of democracy, is one way to put it. And um, I I weave in it, I weave memoir and history. So I'm not going to uh, go into into the book a whole lot tonight because I want us to focus more on the debate. But but the the the, the things that the thing that um, I start out really actually talking about 18th century, you know, 18th century philosophy in the book and talking about how in my childhood uh, I was given, a, 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 a way, I was raised with the psychology of democracy because when uh, my parents told me to do something and I said, no, I don't want to do that, tell me why, they would get, my, my father, especially my mother, both, they would give me a rational explanation rather than saying because I said so. And, the, and that's very different than the psychology of monarchy, which is because I said so. And I had a very dramatic experience because my parents divorced when I was six and I was sent to live with my grandparents who raised children according to the because I said so regime. And w when you give your children uh, some kind of uh, rational explanation of why you're doing something, it doesn't mean that you give, you give in to their irrational uh, answers back because they're mostly kind of nutty what kids will say back to you when they don't want to behave. But, but, um, but it means that you give them a chance to be reasonable. You give them a chance to understand things. And of course parents are not always right, but it also means that you engage their minds and you enable them to begin to learn to reason. So I, I wrote about that learning process in the first chapter of the book and then I move into and, and, uh, examining from a, in a different way the very things that George is examining, which is why do people vote against their self-interest? And that's one of the things that interests me so much tonight uh, and, and in this election, both with, with regard to working class issues and feminist issues. The, the, we have in Sarah Palin, in my mind, someone who has, uh, she's like a poster child for working class issues and women, women's issues in the sense of that, well, I should say she's like a cut out paper doll for those issues. In other words, she's like a, a poster in the sense that she's two, it's a two dimensional image that's projected. And she doesn't actually stand up. None of her positions and none of McCain's positions essentially fight for or stand for what working class people need nor for what women need. And in fact, she would undo much of what feminism fought for over the last several decades. And uh, so my question is, why is it that, uh, and there are a significant number of working class people who are voting for McCain, even though Obama's way up in the polls and there are even some women who are voting for McCain. Now, one explanation for that is racism. So I'll just, I, I go into that briefly in the chapter 
well, not briefly in my book, it's chapter, it's the fifth chapter called Song of Myself, and America has two, two strains in it. One is that great poem uh, by, by Walt Whitman, which is part of Leaves of Grass, Song of Myself, and it's not Song of Me, 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 it's not a narcissistic poem, it's when he, how he defines myself as, I look and see the working man walking on the street, I see the dock worker, I see uh, the, 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 uh, an African-American person enslaved, I see an orphan kid on the street, I see an Irish washerwoman, I see a Native American, I am all those people. That's what he means, song of myself, I am all those people. That sense of deep connectedness, which is part of uh, American, is part of the psychology of democracy. If you have equal rights under the law, what that means psychologically is that if I have the right for, for, to free speech, then you must have it too. That's literally what it means. The psychology behind that encourages me to empathize with you. We don't always do it, but it's there in the legal structure and encouragement to think, oh, you must want and need what I want and need. So it's there in, in, the, in the fundamental structure. But uh, we have another tendency, which is the psychology of monarchy, which is not only because I said so, but that, you know, we look to authority to solve all our problems. And uh, we want paper doll. The, 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 that psychology would want a paper, paper doll, a two-dimensional image, uh, to replace reality, because reality is frightening. So I'll just end with a, 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 an and, and as part of that, part of uh, uh, that psychology, what 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 happens with those who um, not only are operate not only are for the elite class, which is really what McCain and Republicans are for at this point. They are not for working people, although they accuse Democrats and progressives of being elite. It's so ironic, but that's that's part of that's part of the game plan. Because what has been done traditionally from almost the first days of the Republic is that people are set against each other so that you had some of the first street riots in the United States were Irish people rebelling against uh, African-American freedmen who came, came up to the, the northern states. Um, you had white southerners battling reconstruction, battling giving equal rights to African-Americans. Women, feminists, and African Americans were set against each other in a fight for the vote, and uh, so so the, the Republicans are still practicing that with running, putting a woman up as vice president, not because she's qualified, but because she's a woman to try to gain, you know, the Hillary Clinton votes. Basically, it's a very cynical move, I believe. So, um, so what 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 I uh, the question that I, I I'm I'm asking. Uh, why do people vote against themselves? I answer partly with an answer that George Lakoff has so lucidly given us all, and that is the framing. If you don't frame something, you don't see it. You go back to Wittgenstein and probably even before philosophically, but if you don't have the word for a sunset, you don't see a sunset. I know this myself from my own background. My father was a working man, he was a fireman. I didn't understand he was a working person. So my grandparents were slightly snobbish to him, even though they liked him, I didn't know why. It was never mentioned, it was never said out loud. Class was not something you could ever discuss in the 50s in America. So I didn't understand it until I began to get more educated in high school. Um, and that was true with one of the labor leaders that I write in the book, Rose Schneiderman, who was working 16 hours a day, earning only pennies a day, not enough money even to provide a meal, a full meal at dinner, often just living on, on you know, crust, literally a crust of bread and maybe a little bit of cheese. And she didn't understand that she was being exploited. She didn't have the language for that. She didn't have the way, even though she was having the direct experience. So uh, I think that we're in that, that same battle again. More people are seeing through it, but we have psychologically a great distance to go. So I'm, I'm going to stop there and end it. I want to thank Catherine.
Taylor again for setting this up, and thank you all for coming. Uh, Susan is one of my favorite writers for a reason you will discover tonight, if you haven't begun to already. Uh, what she does in her book is uh, really tell you why politics matters in your daily life. I mean, think about that. Most people say, well, politics is out there. It's not. It's in here. <coughs> You, know, you will not see a better statement of that than wrestling with the angel of the um, I want to say a little bit about this book, which is the, the fifth book on, uh, that I've done on politics and cognitive science. Uh, it's the first one in which I actually go into the science, uh, not in technical language and so on, but, but go through basically what's needed to understand the politics. Um, and the hook in this book is the following. Uh, we were raised with a view of what reason is that comes out of the Enlightenment. And um, that view goes like this. It says that reason is conscious. You know, I think, therefore I am. I know I'm reasoning. Right? That reason is conscious that it is dispassionate, that passion gets in the way of reason, that it can fit the world directly, that it's logical, and that we all have the same reason. That's why uh, we can uh, be told the facts and reason to the right conclusion logically and all in the same way. That's the assumption of the enlightenment, of enlightenment reason. It's supposed to be... Is that okay? Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. Let me repeat that then. <laughs> the reason is conscious, dispassionate, passion gets in the way of reason, that it fits the world directly, that's the assumption, that it's logical, Though, so if you got the facts, you can reason to the right conclusion, that we all have the same reason, because that's what makes it, us human, that it's abstract, it's not physical, and that it's based on our interests, that, that we have reason to pursue our own purposes. That is the classical view that, uh, that we were raised with. I was raised with it. You all know it. You see it every day. It's part of the Democratic Party view, unfortunately. And um, the problem with it is, Every part of it's false. <laughs> what we've learned in cognitive science and neuroscience is every single piece is false. Most reason is unconscious, 98%. 98%. Uh, you can't reason without being emotional. Why? If you have a stroke that doesn't allow you to feel emotion or tell what anyone else feels, you wouldn't know what to want. And people who have such strokes don't know what to want and can't make any rational descri description, any rational decisions about what to do. They mess up constantly. Right? You can't reason without emotion. We don't, reason doesn't fit the world directly. Why? Because it's physical. It's not abstract. You reason with your brain. Everything you know, everything you experience, everything you see or hear comes through your brain. And brains are not general purpose devices. They're set up to run bodies. And you're reasoning with this very complicated device, which doesn't work like a general logic machine or a computer at all. I mean, I work in a, a neurocomputation lab. We know how this works. And it doesn't work that way. Right? Now, uh, how does it work? You reason in terms of what has been called frames, that is, structures uh, that you put on the world and uh, we sometimes put them all on the same way. Uh, we reason in terms of cultural narratives that have emotion built in. We reason in terms of, of metaphor. And th those are crucial things to know because they're not obvious, they're mostly unconscious. You know, they had to be discovered mostly in the last 30 years, right? They're not obvious. You don't know how you reason you know, it has to be figured out. That's crucial, and we've been able to do, we know a lot about how to figure it out. The, the other part is about uh, self-interest. It turns out that um, we have a physical capacity for empathy, and it's physical. It's built into what's called the mirror neuron system, that is, we have in the premotor cortex uh, neurons that not only control how we uh, perform complex actions, but the same neurons fire when we see someone else performing the same actions. Those neurons 
are connected to our emotional regions. And that's why you can see somebody joyous and feel their joy, writhing in pain and feel their pain. We are physically set up for empathy. We may inhibit that empathy, we may be raised not to use it, but we are physically endowed with the capacity for empathy. And a lot of our actual reason, it's not that we don't have it, we reason metaphorically, we reason through frames, we reason through narrative. That's crucial. Now, what does this have to do with politics? Everything, as you've just seen. <laughs> we'll get into it in great detail. Um, one of the things that's important, um, there's a reason why Susan started with the family. I wrote a book uh, called Moral Politics some years back, that uh, one of the, the metaphors that we all grow up with is the nation as a family. What, oh, sorry, we all grew up with this idea of the nation as a family. It's there, it's everywhere in our politics. Uh, and there's a reason why all these guys are talking about their families all the time. Now, uh, we have two very different models of the family, the ones exactly that Susan was talking about, the nurturing parent family and the strict father family. Uh, I can go into them in greater detail later, but you should, Susan, I think you all know instinctively what that's about. And um, they get mapped onto our politics. They get mapped onto two different ways of, mor of reasoning morally. Uh, now, what's interesting is we grow up in a culture where we're all, we're all exposed to both of them. And most of us have both ways of reasoning. So, I mean, for example, you may be as nurturant as you can possibly be in your families, in your politics, etc. But if you go to a movie and watch uh, Arnold, an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie and you understand it, then you have the strict father model of the world because you have to understand the movie. <laughs> and it turns out there are a lot of people in in this um, uh, in this country who are who reason like conservatives on some issues and like liberals on other issues. Uh, I call them biconceptuals, and our brains are set up for that. Uh, our brains are set up. In order, I'm sorry. <laughs> our brains are set up for. Uh, uh, to be able to have two opposite modes of reasoning uh, that uh, uh, are not even noticed. The mechanism is called mutual inhibition, where the activation of one neural circuit inhibits the activation of the other, whichever it is. Very common. Uh, let me give you a non-political example of this. Uh, consider the, somebody who has a, um, a Saturday night morality and a Sunday morning morality. <laughs> Right? And, and never notices the difference. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's very, very common. It's not just about politics. Okay, one quick, uh, two quick things that you that that follow from this and that are very important. Back in the late 1960s, uh, conservative operatives, uh, you know, working for the Richard Nixon campaign, uh, noticed a couple of things that were important to them. They noticed that a lot of working people uh, had conservative ideas about patriotism and the family. That they were very much upset with both the Vietnam protests and feminism. And what they did was they started talking to those working folks about those issues, activating the conservative way of thinking in their brain. When you activate a mode of thinking, you make it stronger because the synapses get stronger when something's active. Active. At the same time, they invented an idea, the idea of the liberal elite, right? The latte liberal, the liberal media, the Hollywood liberals, the tax and spend liberals, etc. They're calling it, it the irregular, the regular liberal, liberal now. Right. The what? The irregular. Irregular, the rocket, the kind of salad, you know. I see. Oh, oh, arugula. 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 <laughs> They're arugula liberals, right. So we have arugula liberals, etc. You, you get the general idea. Now, uh, what's, uh, what that did, of course, was inhibit the working people's normal uh, positive views of their unions, their union members, uh, their, uh, their views about the environment, which are often 
uh, very, very progressive. Their views about community, where people care about each other, they inhibited those as being as being liberal views. So what they did was create a very powerful uh, thing, namely. Uh, they changed the brains of many people, who were working people, to be conservative populists. And that is who Sarah Palin is working yeah. for. That is why she's appealing to populism. That is why she's saying, we're for the ordinary Main Street folks. Well, she had Main Street and, and, uh, and Wall Street mixed up there. A little Freudian slip, but anyway. But the, the point is that, that, you know, that's what she's appealing to. Secondly, there's another thing you need to know. Uh, why did Ronald Reagan get elected? Right? Well, uh, I met his chief strategist a few years ago, uh, a guy named Richard Worthland, who uh, is very well known in my profession. Uh, and uh, he's retired now, a fine gentleman, uh, very proud of his, his conservative credentials. And I asked him uh, over lunch, I invited him to lunch, I said, you know, what was it like? to be Reagan's chief strategist. And he said, I took my first poll. What happened? I found out nobody liked Reagan's positions on issues, but they all wanted to vote for Reagan. And I didn't know why. So I started studying this, and I discovered why. Five things. One, Reagan talked about values, and people cared about values. And when Reagan talked about an issue, it was to exemplify a value. Second, uh, Reagan uh, communicated very well, he connected to people, with people. People liked that. Third, he seemed authentic. That is, he came across as saying what he believed, and people saw him as authentic. Uh, fourth, therefore, if you know somebody's values, they're authentic and they can communicate with you, you can trust them. You can, at least you can tr trust in what they're going to do. You know where they stand whether you agree with them or not. And last, identity. They identified with them for all those reasons. Okay? That is what you saw in Sarah Palin tonight. That those are the things that she and McCain are trying to capitalize on here. Okay? Yes? Well, I don't know. Did you forget about the fact that the Reagan administration manipulated Iran to keeping the hostages? And therefore, uh, there's all this. There are, lot, those are, there are real political reasons, and that's, I'm not saying that that's the only reason. But the question is, why was he so popular under all of those things, even when stuff like that came out? Well, it's not valid to separate out one thing from the other. Well, we'll why don't we talk about that? Why don't that we wait until... Uh, yeah, a very, we'll a very take reasonable the questions. question. Yeah. That. I just want to point out that this is what George Bush did. And in fact, in the nomination campaign, it was what Barack Obama did. And you know, and you might think that this is illegitimate because it can be manipulated and has been, but it's not crazy. That is, if you don't know what's going to happen two years from now, you're voting on whether someone agrees with your values, whether they're telling you the truth, whether you can understand what they're saying, uh, whether you trust them and whether you identify with them. That's not nutty, but easy to manipulate. And that's what you're seeing here. So I'll stop there, and then we'll take lots of questions. The Forests and Clean Sky Initiative, but what they're saying seems like such bold-faced lies. It doesn't take much reasoning to see the truth behind what they're saying. Why, why do I perceive that, and why do other people who support them not have that same kind of reasoning? For exactly the reason I just said. Let me try to repeat the question. Why is it that when they lie so clearly and they repeat the lies over and over, that you and I can see the lies and other people cannot? Okay, very simple. Um, what framing is, framing has to do with how your brain is shaped. A frame is a physical neural circuit in your brain that doesn't go away and it doesn't change. And every time words that evoke that frame, uh, that, that, that frame is used, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger, but it doesn't disappear, okay? If you are thinking, and, you, and your only way of understanding the world is through your neural circuitry, 
And that neural circuitry is inconsistent with what you hear. You won't hear it. You'll find an excuse for it. You'll find a way to ignore it. You know, unless you're somebody who actually says, I'm going to really consciously keep track of my contradictions. There are people like that, but not too many. You won't hear it, and they won't hear it. And that's why. And that's why framing is so important. Because what has happened is the conservatives over the past 30 to 40 years have marketed <coughs> their framing of their view of the world and their language. And they've done it through institutions that they've built, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars a year, now billions of dollars. They have built these institutions, and Democrats have not. And I, I, I have an answer that is, uh, goes, you know, sort of dovetails exactly with what George said. I don't know if you ever read uh, Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism, but the, but she had she has a brilliant description in there of uh, Germany uh, during the latter part of World War II when German cities were being bombed. And if you if you happen to be in Germany any time, uh, you know, in the in, maybe even. 20, even 10 years ago, there, there were still remains that were there. There were still cities that looked bombed out, but at, cert, you know, at a certain point, many, many German cities were just reduced to rubble and they were hardly functional. But Goebbels, who was, in head, of, who was a head, of, head of propaganda, basically uh, you know, kept saying to the people, oh, the Allies are not successful in their campaign of bombardment against our cities. They're hardly able to do any damage. So what, pe what Hannah Arendt's analysis of that was that when people saw it, they took it, they were experiencing, they were suffering, they took it in with their own eyes and ears and they could smell it, they, they, they had grief, they, you know, it, they, they knew their cities were in rubble. But what they said to themselves, and this speaks to what George is saying, they said to themselves, they, meaning the the fathers is how I would put it, the, the, author the authorities, must know something we don't. And, and that's exactly what this nation did, by the way, in the build-up to the Iraq War, including highly, highly experienced journalists used to ferreting out the truth. They must know something we don't know, including that. Well, that's one of the reasons I didn't vote for Hillary, because that was what she would say when, when, when those of us who were against the war would go and appeal to her. She would say, I know things you know, that I can't tell you about, but I think also she was saying to herself, they know things that I don't know. So it's a, it's a, and then the other thing that, that went along with that is that Goebbels would tell the same lie over and over again. And uh, he was one of the first sort of modern publicists who understood, and of course it's, it's, it's uh, stock and trade in, in uh, uh, advertising campaigns. You repeat the same lie over and over again, and that's exactly what the McCain campaign is doing. And by the way, I uh, just want a brief repeat of that. Um, I got a call last week from a New York Times reporter who said, uh, we've been reporting on all the lies that McCain, McCain has been telling, and so is the rest of the press, and he keeps telling them. Why? <laughs> Why did he just stop? Yeah. And I explained that if he keeps telling them, first of all, not, not his guys don't necessarily read the New York Times, but in addition to that, uh, if he keeps telling them, then the, that, that part of the brain is made more active over and over again, and they come to sound more like the truth, because that changes your brain. And I, I just yeah. want to add one thing, I, oh, I love all this, I'm sorry, just, this will be very brief, which is that uh, the psychological, there's a, something psychological as well as in the cognitive structure of the brain that goes along with this, and that is that uh, if people here who are psychologists will know this phenomena. Uh, uh, children who've been abused sexually or emotionally or physically do not want to admit that they've had this abuse and want to remain loyal to the abusive parent because it is terrifying to think of going without that parent. That parent. Uh, you know, it, it represents their security and safety in the world. And so it is preferable to accept a lie than to question, you know, the, the authority figure who is lying. Yes. Um, we're talking about some of the prevalent lies that, that conservatives tell themselves. What are the kinds of lies that we liberals tell ourselves. <laughs> well, uh, the first one 
is that if we just tell people the facts, they'll reason to the right conclusion. <laughs> and this is very, very important because it's the basis of all the entire liberal policy machine. Liberal policies are, um, there are two kinds of policy, uh, two aspects of policy, cognitive policy and material policy. Material policy is the nuts and bolts. Cognitive policy is the values behind the material policy that make it the right kind of policy. Uh, you know. Now, uh, for progressive policy makers, they only know about material policy. They don't think about cognitive policy at all. They don't think about the values behind it. They don't think about what the, the public is supposed to do because they believe in the rational actor model. They believe if you just tell people the truth that everything is literal and that, uh, you know, they'll reason to the right conclusion, that you just, you know, do the right material policy and everything will be okay and everyone will see why that's right. That is the biggest lie that liberals tell themselves. Right? The biggest lie. And it is deadly to their own cause. Now, there are others as well that we can imagine but, and, and talk about, but I think that that is the one that is, you know, messing people up the most because it keeps them from seeing narratives, it keeps them from understanding the role of emotion, it keeps them from understanding the role of metaphor and framing, and why, and it keeps them from understanding that if you want to communicate a truth, you have to frame it correctly so people will see what the truth is yeah. and what its moral value is. Who won? Hmm? Who, won? Who won the debate? Yes. That's an interesting you know, question. I, who knows? You know, I mean, I, I, of course, I thought that Biden won, but we, but in the, what's the, what is the public going to think? I don't know. I, I think she really slipped up too many times and, and ushered a little bit too much gibberish. I think. <laughs> well, know, but, but it's hard to say. She came on strong at the end. Yeah. And to her people, she would be very strong at the end. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I would be very interested to see. I don't, I don't think. Uh, you know, that she's going to do terribly. I think she did yeah. well enough for, you know. For her folks. For her folks. I agree. Okay. Or, yeah. Uh, yeah. You, I read your recent article uh, where you talked about what you just said about the liberals not framing things properly and focusing too much on reason and facts. I gather not, not focusing too much on reason and facts. Not framing. That not is focusing framing. on unframed mm -hmm. facts. As a frame and, and and without, I, so that people wouldn't understand their significance. And I gather from that 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 you're not consulting with the Obama campaign. And I'm just wondering why the hell aren't they using you after all these years? You've been advising Democrats and progressives on how to frame these issues. What what's going on? Why are you in touch with that campaign? Um, well, several things. First, I have not been hired by that campaign uh, or approached by it. Secondly, I volunteered some time ago, but they have, I, I should say several things. First, they have a lot of smart people there. Yeah. I know people who are, they're speech writers, I know people in there, they're no dopes. So that's first. They make mistakes. Uh, I also, if necessary, under, if, when they're really screwing up, I can get things to them. And a few times, uh, and by the way, they haven't screwed up that much. I haven't had to, to do that very often. I have a few times, and, and they've changed things in two days. So basically, but, but uh, you know, they, the, the important thing to understand about a campaign is run by an ad advertising agency. All campaigns are, they have their own people, their own team, and, and not only that, that team has to be there 16 hours a day, every day. You know, I'm teaching at Berkeley. They're in Chicago. <laughs> so I don't know exactly what the story is on this, but um, they're pretty good. Yeah, I think they're too high. Yeah. Do you see a conspiracy in the use, the great use, of the word nuclear? <laughs> no. No, I, it, it, it's odd though, isn't it? Now that, that would be something to, to crack, you know, why does both of them, except that they're in the same circles. No, no, they, 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 they actually, yeah. it's very, it's a very interesting about this, and I'm glad you asked this question. Uh, really glad you asked it, because uh, as a linguist, I was told, repeat it, the question, do I see a conspiracy in the use of the word nuclear? Nuclear. Okay. Nuclear. 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 Okay. Um, you know, Parallel to arugula, I think. Yes. <laughs> right. Very, what's, there's, 
something very important about it, and, and it's a key to a number of things. Um, you know, the um, I was called in as a linguist by the Atlantic Monthly in 2004 to look at the, George, the tapes of George Bush's first run for office as a congressman in Texas when he lost. In the, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. He never mispronounced the word, spoke in syntactically complete sentences, and argued in classical rhetorical form, which he learned at Yale from the same debate coach as John Kerry. And he lost badly to a Bubba. And he said after that he would never be out Bubba again. Is that a quote? Did he say that? And he, I guarantee you, he never said nuclear at Andover, at Yale, at Harvard, you know, or at Kenny Bunkport. Right? He learned how to talk Texan and move Texan and move with his body and dress Texan. He learned how to do it. And there's, there are very, there's a very interesting thing. I, I happened to turn on the, the, the TV one day, and they were showing a clip of a visit to the White House by one of his old friends from Yale. And there was an official uh, camera set up there, but the, it hadn't been turned on yet. And he was talking to this guy in his Yale accent. <laughs> and then the camera went on, and he went into the Texas accent. Right? So, and Karen Hughes says in one of her books, uh, as a speechwriter, that he always corrected her speeches to make them fit classical rhetorical form. Mm -hmm. Right? This is not a person who is an utter dope. He is very clever. He may not know certain things, but he's a very clever guy. And, uh, you know, there's a reason for nuclear. There's a reason for the gee whiz uh, way of speaking. There's a reason for all of her gestures oh, and yeah. why they work. Dropping the G's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dropping the G, dropping G, and so on, right? And G, and winking. This, yeah. is, this is choreographed. Yeah. Highly, highly choreographed. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and there's a long history in, in America of, of anti-intellectualism, which has deepened, actually, paradoxically, because public education has been more widely disseminated. I mean, in the 19th century, not everybody had the right to an education, and that had to be fought for, partly in tandem with the women's movement, by the way. But, you know, um, somehow, and this, this was what the Republicans did, too, very, very, very successfully, to brand in, you know, starting with uh, right. Adlai Stevenson. Right. But the, we, before I call on some folks on the other side of the group, uh, <laughs> the anti this is much or more anti-intellectualism on the left. And that's, that's something true. that people don't necessarily, people who are liberals don't necessarily understand. Can you say that again? There's at least as much anti-intellectualism on the left. It's very important that that be recognized. Uh, you know, because what you what I've been finding out is conservatives tend to read more than liberals, and they tend to respect and fund their intellectuals more than liberals. Liberals don't liberal institutions don't fund their intellectuals. The conservatives do. And it's one of the reasons that they've been so successful. Yeah, that's I can tell you that. Question. Yeah. Um, so um, I agree with everything you've said so far, and how Democrats uh, haven't learned to frame issues. Um, Ronald Reagan was, what, 25 years ago? Why haven't why the Democrats learned how to speak to working class people in a way that they'll respond to vote for them? You forgot about well, They have a problem. They went to college. <laughs> and they and they took courses. And they, they took courses in Enlightenment reason. And, they, and I'm serious about that. That is, if you uh, if you are a political science major or an economics major or a pre-law major, you will learn that enlightenment reason is the basis of our democracy, and that uh, it is the basis of our economic system, and that that is, is the basis of all our policy, and that is the right way to do things, and, it, and that it, that it defines what critical thinking is. 
And it turns out it's completely false. What is taught as critical thinking is not critical thinking. Real critical thinking looks at the way people really reason. They really reason using frames and metaphors and emotions and, you know, uh, and all those other things. It is not all based on, on self-interest and so on. This and that's is, crucial. Uh, yes. so I, I think, I, I think I it's... To say this, you are all ignoring the fact, no matter what liberals do or what Republicans do, that the last two elections were stolen. It had, does it really only have to do with how we use words or how we use liberals, how we are viewed as liberals or how we think that we're using uh, reason? No. It has to do with the distortion of the electoral process completely. It is not based on what we did wrong as progressive people. That's that is not the, wrong. The, the, the elections were stolen. We have no democracy. It's a lie. We have a fair, fair, we have an illusion of democracy. And so the real reason we failed is because the election was manipulated. The touch electoral devices will be manipulated again. They will put up barricades so that black people can't vote in Florida. In Ohio, they will destroy votes. You just have to remember that and stop looking at liberals as being people who can, are somehow defective. Can I answer that? Yeah. Um, I'm not in disagreement with you at all. I think that's a very, excuse me, I think that's a very, very important uh, aspect to remember that that is a very large part of it. And, it, and, and we also have these felon lists that are going on today. Um, so, so this is a very, the other very, very important part that we must recognize is that that the major media is in the hands of something like five corporations, and the media constantly frames, speaking of framing, they frame these elections and the debate, like we saw tonight, as if it were a football game, and they do not discuss the issues. They don't, even on MSNBC, which is the only one I can bear to watch anymore, but even they do not say, was, you know, was this candidate right on this issue? What are the real facts? They say, well, I think this person made a better impression, this person is going to get better appeal rather than were they right or were they wrong. So that, so that we, so that that, ten, that, that ten, it's called pandering. And it's pandering to the, to the worst part. I, I think that, that reason is an important element, but it's also extremely important for us to realize that there is no way to separate reason from emotion. This is one of the things that the feminist movement established. Women were always accused of being too emotional. Um, I remember a good friend of mine who died a number of years ago, but she was a nuclear activist, and she was constantly, uh, people were always saying, you're too emotional about this issue, and there was an interview uh, that she made just before she died, and she said, she said, if you can't be emotional about the fact that your children and your grandchildren may be destroyed in a nuclear holocaust, what are emotions for? What are you going to get emotional about? That, that sort of repression, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, making uh, the entire uh, repression of emotion equivalent with rationality and, and, and reason. And, and, you know, even people who appear to be very tight in reason, there is this turmoil of emotions underneath that are hidden, that aren't evident, that are guiding everything. So there's just, and, and learn as, as, you know, George, who's a cognitive scientist, will tell you, what, you know, you cannot learn without emotion. So these things are dovetailed. And I think, you know, the point that I'm making, and I, I, I think George is too, I'm, I'm going to let him speak for himself in a moment, but what, what my, feeling, <laughs> my, feeling, my feeling is not that, not that uh, one should, you know, reason is, is important. It's an important human faculty. It was part of what established democracy. Reason was set up, uh, in, in fact, in opposition to authority, uh, the king and the church would say, "This is what is true," and you couldn't <coughs> question it, you know, through reason. So it, it, it's very important, and, and reason is used in courtrooms. It's it's used in, in, in legal opinion and in writing briefs. Reason is important, but it, not with the naive. We, we have to, we have to, it's reason, by the way, scientific reason that has led us to understand that reason is not apart from emotions. Right, exactly right. Reason and real reason has emotions built in. That's the point. Yes. We have to look at what real reason is. But I, the question that was asked 
requires a, strong, a, a stronger response. First of all, it's basically right, but only half right. And the other half is, and the other half is equally important. We know about the stealing of elections. Why is it that it has not yes. permeated our consciousness? Why is it that the, that the Democrats have not voted on this stuff, have not acted, etc.? Right? Because they do not control public discourse. They have not built the institutions to, to, so that that idea can get out there in public, and the other guys have. Right? You, you know, you know, why is it that the, that, um, you know, it's conservative corporations that own the media. Well, that was brought up in 1971. There was a document put out, um, uh, you know, uh, that designed the conservative think tank system and the buying of media by the right. There are just as many billionaires on the left. They could have bought up media if they had understood about framing and about the mind and about how that worked. They didn't and they still don't. They're doing nothing about it. Right? That half, it, it's one half, that half, the, the half about the control of the mind, is what governs whether or not we act. The, 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 the bloodless revolutions that occurred in Eastern Europe, uh, uh, in, in, at least in, 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 the, in the former Czechoslovakia, uh, the first thing that happened was that they got control of the media. And that happened throughout uh, Eastern Europe. It wasn't the first thing, it was something that happened very quickly. They got control of the media. And that's what we don't understand as liberals and progressives. Yeah. There's an issue that hasn't been voiced tonight, and it certainly wasn't in the debate, that's very present in the emotions and in the unconscious, which is race. Yes. And the white supremacist system that we enjoy. And yes. Actually, I did speak to it, if you remember. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay. But could you talk about where that lives in the in uh, the minds of voters and how dangerous it is, or you, maybe you don't think it's... It's a very, very important issue, and I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, I, I, it's discussed at some length in uh, this book, Moral Politics, and um, with it, and it's there within the uh, conservative worldview. In the conservative worldview, the people who should be in authority, who should be running things, are, should be the moral people, that is the people who have conservative, the conservative view of what morality is. Okay? And that's a hierarchy, that there should be a, a hierarchy of power that reflects a hierarchy of conservative morality. The way you find out about the hierarchy of power uh, since this is a, a, a world ruled by God, is that you look at who has had it traditionally. So it's God above man, man above nature, adults above children, America above other countries, Western uh, culture above non-Western culture, men above women, uh, whites above non-whites, uh, straights above gays, Christians above non-Christians, and so on. Got the idea? <laughs> it's right in there. It's built into the system. Racism is inherent in that system. And it's grim. Now, it, that doesn't mean all conservatives are racists. It turns out that a lot of conservatives cut out after the first five parts of the hierarchy. You know, yes, America is better, Western culture is better, but, you know, no, they're not going to say that, you know, uh, the whites are better than blacks. But it's, it's in the hierarchy. It's in, it's in that hierarchy, and there's a reason why you find so many conservatives who are racists. Now, on the other hand, you have, if you look at the nurturing parent model, equality is built in. It's part of who you are. That is, you know, parents are supposed to be equal, and children are supposed to care about other people, that their job is to care about themselves, be responsible for themselves as well as others, and have empathy toward others. It is through that empathy that equality comes in, right? There's a reason why things are divvied up the way they are. So, um, I would say that even underneath that system, or alongside of it, is uh, what feminism talks about, which is what's so, so ludicrous about Sarah Palin claiming to stand on the shoulders of Hillary Clinton and Geraldine Ferraro. Uh, feminism 
it, it is, is critical, essentially, of systems of domination in general. So it's not just uh, men over women, but it's all systems of domination. That, that, the, 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 feminism went in the direction of looking at the, the uh, relationship between some powerful men and some women as being a kind of a paradigm for the relationship that runs through society with the idea that there must be domination and someone must dominate. And the football metaphor, the football framing for these debates is written right in the dominator model. Rian Eisler has written you know, a number of books about this. But uh, that, that's been uh, foundational and feminine. You know, I analyzed rape as being an act of domination more than sexuality. So um, uh, racism is part of that system of domination. Now, by the way, there is conservative feminism. And it's very important that you understand there are powerful organizations now set up of conservative feminists throughout America, and uh, Sarah Palin is a member of one of them. And they, their idea is very different. Their idea is they take a conservative view of the family, and they say, you know, women are supposed to function within that and support it, and how can they? They have to be strong on their own. They have to be as strong as men in order to fulfill their role in that conservative family. See, one thing that's so interesting about that is that at one point the conservative position was that women should stay at home and raise their families. Now the, the, the feminism, as it was originally coined, uh, which was not conservative feminism, has influenced conservative women to the degree that they no longer are critical of Sarah Palin for not staying at home and raising her children. But at one point, they would have been highly critical of her for not doing that. So there's also a kind of change that goes on in culture among the people, quite apart from any political debates or elections, which is as powerful as any other form of change. I just think that at this point, we're facing an election that's so important that you know we may not have an earth to stand on, if we don't uh, do the right, achieve the right thing in this election, it's very, very critical. Yes. I want to ask you, uh, what do you make of the, the gestures and the the way the king would not look at Obama oh, in yeah. relationship to this uh, great change of being idea? Something like you're not really there. Or, uh, I don't know. You you're not worth recognizing. You said it. You Repeat said it. Questions. You said it. You're, you, 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 what, what, you know, what, 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 what do we make of the gestures in the debate between McCain and Obama? Was it, you know, did it mean you're not really there, I don't recognize you exactly? So I think you're exactly right about that. And what you get with Palin is insincere politeness. <laughs> yes. Yeah. A little louder, please. So you look at you know, like Ronald Reagan, look at George W. Bush, you know, the guy you have a beer with, you know, sort of relatable. Uh, Bill Clinton was that way, kind of a relatable person. I, when I see Sarah Palin, I don't see a relatable person. I see somebody who like looks very stiff and has a bunch of talking points that she irritates. And she says the right things, but she doesn't say it the right way. But you're not in the right subculture. But do you <laughs> their appeal, but her appeal, it doesn't seem like she evokes empathy in that way, that, that you can really identify her and say, like, you know. Now, now their appeal was not evoking empathy yeah. at all. Yeah. It, was, it was evoking identity. Yeah. And if you, right. you know, if you are right. a conservative populist, then uh, you have, she has that appeal. Uh, and it's not because of empathy, it's because of identity. But, but why, why do their numbers, like, plummet as soon as she's gotten unscripted? Well, it turns out that she's not very, she's not dominant in those situations where she's supposed to be. See, look, the one thing that the strict father or mother cannot be, there's two things they can't be. One of them is weak, and the, and the other one uh, is betraying their, their principles. She's not betraying her principles, but she really looked weak. And that, you know, that just doesn't go. That doesn't fly. 
And here, at the end, she came on strong. She looked weak at the beginning. George, yes. can I ask you about, um, I'm, I'm perplexed at why so often, for instance, what's happening in Congress and Carlbrook, Democrats seem to like to talk, 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 and they, but they won't follow through. I'm just completely perplexed. We now have a Democratic Congress and they will not hold Grove accountable. They have the power to do it and over and over again they won't do it. So the Republicans just do whatever they want. Why can't, why don't the Democrats stand up and take the action they talk about? For exactly the reason I said, for two, mm -hmm. two parts. One, they're scared um, that of fear of framing. Fear of being framed by the the conservative machine on the other side when they don't have a machine. They're they're afraid of being told of uh, being called weak on the war, uh, you know, wanting to lose, uh, you know, not supporting the troops or whatever. Uh, they're afraid. Secondly, um, they do they believe in enlightenment reason, and so they don't build those institutions. They don't do what they need to do. But in addition to that, there is a lot of internal politics. Uh, for example, in the House, you have three divisions. Uh, you have the blue dogs, the centrists, and the progressives. And Nancy, who comes from the progressive group, has got to hold them together somehow. And the progressives together are the largest group, but they're not more than half. The other guys together have a majority. And the leaders of those other groups would like to have her job. <laughs> Seriously. So they, you know, she's got to keep her job and keep them together right. when they are scared of the of the other side. And that's a hard job. By the way, I love her. I think that she's doing an amazing job. I don't agree with all of the things she does, and I think there are many things she could do better. But given the position she's in, wow. I couldn't agree more. And I, I think that... Uh, there's something very interesting too when you when you uh, asked about you know what are where, where do liberals have a flaw? I think that one of our flaws is that we we believe that if we elect somebody to office, that then they can do everything, and they can't. That's not how the democratic system works. You have, for instance, in both houses, you have to form coalitions with people that you don't agree with and you have to make compromises and that's the only way that legislation moves. Now we've seen corruption and we've seen people uh, betray their principles. I'm not talking about that, but I am talking about what Nancy Pelosi's been doing and she's been doing it masterfully. So so there's, the, I think that underneath some liberal thinking, we, we ourselves need to evolve, everybody is evolving this. It's very difficult to really inhabit and fully embrace the psychology of democracy. It's very hard. It's a process of profound emotional maturation. I'm not there yet. I don't think anybody is. It's, it's something to achieve and to, to, to move into. But one of, that, one, of the, one of the ways that we need to mature in that way is to we the people are the ones who create the real change. If we want more change to happen in Congress, we have to build on a grassroots level support for a certain movement, a, a certain, certain issues. How did Congress come around finally to at least voicing uh, opposition to the Iraq war? and trying to get bills through to stop the Iraq war. It was because first Code Pink and other organizations like that continued to demonstrate, and that built popular opinion and information got uh, distributed equally among the people. The other thing I want to talk about is the whole, one of the framing, I want to go back to this, that one of the basic framings we, we are dealing with still, and in relation to the war, and one of the reasons the Democrats become afraid is one of the basic Framing is the tough guy. And even the women believe, you know, look at Hillary. She was to the right of Obama on the war. And I believe part of that reason was because she's a woman. She couldn't risk being called weak. So this masculine framing, you know, look at our governor, you know, Mr. Strongman. We, so this is something that we need to start to begin to really challenge. What is real strength? We're not, it, it isn't this tough guy versus weakness. It's what is our real real vision of strength? What does strength really consist of? Joe Biden cried, I think. Yes. Oh. Wasn't that an amazing was moment? Yes. Remember that, that Ed Muskie was knocked out of the race, I think, in the 
70s for crying when his wife was insulted. And, and then Hillary's uh, numbers went up when she quit her. So that represents some movement. I think we've had a lot of movement on that score, yes, and I think Biden will be, in fact, admired for that, or not admired, but loved for that. Yeah. Yes. Um, oh, um, I'm sort of an opinion, but, you know, what I see, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of jockeying for positions, even among progressives. What I'm trying to say by that is that, is that like, Robert Wexler had a, had a website that says, Wexler wants hearings. Now, you sign on to that if you support hearings in a case of a possible impeachment for uh, Cheney and Bush. All you have to do is go on there, sign, put your, your, your email address in, sign on. So he got, in, in the talk radio thing on the progressive side, he got a number of instances where he was listened to. So, what happened? A quarter of a million people signed on. Just a quarter of a million people. How many people really wanted hearings? You know? But it's like other people weren't paying attention to that. Or Wexler couldn't get other people to say, hey, let's do this. This is my website. Or we want hearings. You know, a hundred congressmen say we want hearings. No, it was just a quarter of a million people. Where are the other five million people who agree with that? And all you have to do is get on that particular site and say, Wex, you know, I agree, we should have hearings. Well, they probably didn't. Well, they may, a lot of people, people might, would, might not know. I know, but why weren't other people supporting? Why wasn't that a... a, 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 a uh, uh, a lot of people don't even know who Robert Wexler is. I know, I know, but you, 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 you could put it on any progressive website. You could say that your, your reference to Robert Wexler, congressman from, from you know, you put it in a short paragraph and put a reference there and click on it and sign on. But nobody did. I mean, not enough people did, certainly not. Uh, the, by the way, the move on experience in this is you get about a 2% result. And that could be, and if you have 4.3 million people, that's a lot. Yes, exactly. Why is it that uh, from, the out, from the outside the country, if the, if the right has all these institutions and the billionaires are putting all their money into them, and people are organizing and working for all many causes from outside the country, it looks like the left or whatever doesn't care. Do the, do, do the conservatives care more? It's hard to believe that no. No. everybody else is not acting because they're scared. No, they, 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 the way conservatives have built reason. institutions. And they, coming from a business background, they know about marketing. Marketing is not the rational actor model, right? <laughs> they under, you know, they, it's not like they've studied cognitive science, but the people who teach marketing have. <laughs> right? And they've learned marketing, and they've learned how to market, and they've built a huge institutional structure, you know, that with booking agencies to book their people on TV every day, and so on, uh, with training institutes that train tens of thousands of conservatives every year, I mean, they have a huge structure. Ten years ago, the, the, the liberals finally learned about this structure, and in that time they've done nothing to counter it, but they think they have. That is, they've built things like the Center for American Progress and certain think tanks, but they're all policy think tanks, and they do, two, they do a small number of jobs. One, they do policy, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with doing policy. But it's only material policy, not cognitive policy. Second, they have truth squads. Tell people the truth, they'll reason to the right conclusion. So the Center for American Progress has its truth squad. You have Media Matters, that's another truth squad. Those are the ones who are funded very, very well now by the left. But there's nothing building institutions to get a progressive vision out there. And why? Because they still believe in enlightenment reason. And if you tell people the facts, they'll reason to the right conclusion. That is a huge, huge problem among the liberals. I think, um, you know, when you talked about the left being anti-intellectual, it's a very particular kind of gap that we, that there's a kind of been a, a, a almost leftist populist 
suspicion of any discussion of philosophy or vision. And therefore, we don't, we don't have a, any, any kind of um, weaving together. We don't have enough of, of that on the left. And part of that's been because, in a way, I think we've been more honest. There, we, we had the, the we, you know, we had Stalinism to deal with. We had uh, the collapse of idea systems that turned out not to work so well. Um, and and but we have never filled that. We we tend always to be reactive, and and there's a, been a, a fear and a suspicion, which is, uh, to, to my mind, it does feel quite anti-intellectual, of really looking at deeper causes, and uh, we don't take those ideas seriously enough. Yeah, Nancy. I don't think we've been so much anti-intellectual as we've been anti-cultural. I'm a storyteller. I have a button that says, facts mean nothing outside of a story. And, you know, without ever hearing about George Lakoff, I knew that to be true. And they always put the singers at the end of the rally when everyone has gone home because they're tired of hearing speeches, which are, I suppose, intellectual. And I think we need to... No, they're not intellectual. They're not in the way I'm talking about. Okay, but, they, but yeah. we don't use our own strengths to get to people's emotions yeah. through storytelling, through singing, through drama, which you do, but so much of that is discounted by the left and has been since my mother, Malvina Reynolds, was a communist <laughs> and was discounted and gave up on them. Uh, story, it, in a, if people don't think of storytelling as philosophy, but it is. I mean, it is weaving the facts together in, in, a, in, a, in a coherence. A story is embodied philosophy. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there's something I don't understand. When you, when you say uh, the, the primary mistake liberals make is, is an undue belief in enlightenment and rationalism. And they don't even would, know would, that would, that's would, the, would the inference to that be, therefore, that we should just learn to lie? No, 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 is the alternative to lie? Answer, no. The altern alternative is to learn what real reason is and to use it. And to use it overtly and to understand. For example. Was Biden doing that? Yeah. Biden was doing it in, toward the end. Uh, Biden actually was pretty good at it. At it. Uh, you know, that is, he understood uh, who he had to address, the stories that he had to tell. He had to tell stories at certain times and he told them. You know, he's actually very good at it. And, uh, you know, much better than he's been in the past. I mean, he's, he's, he's gotten better. Uh, and Obama can be very, very good at it. Uh, you know, there was a period when he started becoming a policy wonk. But, the, you know, but he can be extremely great at it. That's one of the greatness of his oratory is his ability to tell stories. Right? That's why, he, why he's so great. And you reason in terms of stories. You reason in terms of metaphors. You reason in terms of frames. And they're emotional. Let me give you a simple example from yesterday. I got a call from Channel 7. A producer there said, I'm being driven nuts by what I'm seeing on TV. Why is the bailout being called a rescue? Yeah. Right? <laughs> and he is very, if you ask a linguist, you're going to get a linguistic answer. Right? Right? What is the framing of a bailout? The person being bailed out is responsible for it himself, and it's a moral flaw, and it can happen again. And nobody feels good about it. You don't feel, and you have to. You have, it costs you to, 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 to do it, and you worry you're going to have to do it again. And you don't feel good. Rescue is part of a hero narrative. The person being rescued is not at fault. It's either a matter of a natural thing or something bad happened to them, and you're a hero for rescuing them. And after the rescue, it's over. You don't have to worry about anything else, right? That those are two different frames. Right? They're there. This is used every single day in the news, and the media doesn't recognize it. You know, I had to tell this guy on Channel 7 who smelled it. <laughs> he smelled it, but he couldn't articulate it. Now, this is not enlightenment reason. This is real reason. 
this is what we have discovered is how people really do reason. And what the Enlightenment did was tell us a false story about reasoning. What is called rationality is not real rationality. It's a phony rationality. What has been discovered in behavioral economics is people don't work by, by, the, 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 by self-interest, one. Two, they don't reason according to the rational actor model. They reason according to cognitive principles. That, you know, why did Danny Kahneman win a Nobel Prize in economics? For showing that, right? Uh, you know, why did Akerlof win a Nobel Prize? For showing that imperfect information and, in, and, in, and uh, uh, unbalanced information was crucial, that cognition mattered in economics, right? This is crucial. It is n your job now is to understand, to get a new enlightenment, an enlightenment that's based on how people really do reason on how it really works, and to understand that. And when you're trying to talk to people, to understand that that is what you have to do. You have to think about how people are really reasoning. And not only that, you can't tell the truth without it. Yeah. You right. cannot tell the truth unless you frame it properly, unless you fit it into the right structure, the right cognitive structure. Otherwise, you know, if you, example, 47 million people don't have health care, right? No, Giuliani gets up there and says, they don't deserve it. Healthcare is a product. It's just like flat screen TVs, right? Not everybody deserves a flat screen TV. You want one? Go out and work and earn one, right? Same thing with healthcare, right? We should privatize it, and then if you really want it, you go earn it, right? That is a different view. It's not a view that says the job of government is to protect its citizens not just against, you know, invasion and, you know, police stuff and so on, but also against uh, all sorts of things, including disease. I mean, you know, this is crucial. It is not, the alternative is not lying. It's learning how to really tell the truth in a way that people really reason. If you think about how reason got separated from emotion, which it, it isn't and it can't be and it never has been, but how did it get separated from emotion? It came from a world view, which was really a world view that was tied to monarchy and tyranny. And that is that uh, uh, reason is above material life. It was, it was tied to a, re a religion that, that placed the spirit above the earth. And, 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 and it's the same hierarchy that placed white people uh, uh, above Europeans, above everybody else on the earth, and men above women, and, you know, and aristocrats above, uh, above common people. And the idea humans was that, 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 yeah, and humans above animals. And the idea was that, that reason belongs to God, and it's got a sort of straight line from some Descartes headed pineal gland, absurd, you know, but, but, you know, I think therefore I am, that reason is separated from the body and emotions. We have found out that that's not true, and that's a really profoundly radical position. That's taking back the body, that's taking back emotions, and when you do that, by the way, in a framing way, you are also putting women and people of color and people from cultures all over the world on the same level playing field. That they, exactly right. And by the way, what Kant did was to take the metaphor that reason should rule. That in the in the you know this this view of the mind as a sort of community of people, you know, there is perception and there is emotion and they're battling emotion is battling reason and so on. The idea of reason should rule. The idea is reason was made the king. You know, that was the, the central metaphor there. And it was enlightenment reason, it was a false view of reason. But that was the idea, and it was actually a very important view in overcoming monarchy, in overcoming, you know, the, the rule of the church. It's historically extremely important move, yeah. but it's false. When you first got up and were speaking, um, George, you talked about five things, and one of them, if I'm remembering correctly, had to do with um, credibility or authenticity. Authenticity, yes. And Two things that I heard, um, one struck me as very authentic, and the other struck me as very phony, and I think therefore frightening. One was when Biden was almost moved to tears when talking about 
know, because I'm not a woman, don't assume that I don't have deep feelings about my child's safety. I may be paraphrasing, but I think I'm close. And that felt very authentic to me. I was quite moved by that. Um, and when Palin, I don't know that anybody else noticed this. I've asked a few people, and everybody I've asked has said no. I don't think I imagined it, but at one point she was using, she used the word rape. She wasn't talking about a human yes, being rape, right, right, right. Yes, she but she used yeah, the word a, rape. Yeah, and as she used the, the word yeah. rape, there was a smile on her face. <laughs> Scared the daylights out of me. Well, you see, and I she think, she was the point I'm trying to make so here is for me, in each of those instances, indeed had to do with authenticity. It felt to me like he was talking from a place of truth and from honor and that she was doing something quite separating. I can't imagine a human being feeling pleasant about it. Well, no, that's All right, she can I say cool. something about that? Too? First of all, it's a very, very important observation. What she was actually talking about was making fun of uh, Biden and Obama for talking about uh, uh, the rape of the oceans and the end, uh, right? Yeah. It's about oil drilling. She was talking about oil drilling. She was talking about oil drilling. She was talking about oil drilling, right. Yeah. Exactly. About oil drilling. Uh, and she's making fun of it. But the way she works is this, and, and it's very important to understand her technique. What she does is she will uh, speak in a surface manner. So the surface mannerisms are pleasant yeah. and smiling and so on. Then there is the literal words that she says, uh, where she says, he said that this was a rape of so-and-so. And then there's what is meant in context. And what is meant in context is completely underhanded and an attack, right? That's, that's what she always does. Uh, there's a very clear example of this yesterday uh, uh, on um, uh, Rachel Maddow's show, where they had this wonderful clip of her being interviewed after she won the governorship, and she was asked by an interviewer, uh, would you put the other people you ran against in your administration, and if so, what positions would you give them? And she said, well, the first one, I'd make him a statistician. Yeah. Oh, right? Because he was like, full of facts. He was yeah, he's full of facts. We can just ignore him, you know. He's, and it's the anti-intellectual view, the liberal elite stuff, and so she's playing into that. But she was smiling. She, this was in the form of a compliment. Literally, she said she'd make him a statistician, which could mean something good, but in context, she was putting them down, right? The other guy said, well, I think he should be a chef, you know? He cooks really, really well, right? But he can cook for me, you know? I mean, this is, again, supposedly a compliment in the form of a compliment, literally, but in context, it's a knife. Yeah. And that's who she is. Well, she's, she's like the mean girl in high school, right? But, most, <laughs> but, but, yeah. I, but there's another example of... Uh, most, there, mostly, uh, though, she was using the word rape, opposite of man. Wait, That's mostly what was happening there, right? The, the, um, you know, there was an article in the, in the New York Times a couple of days ago. It was a review of a TV show, which I didn't see. I think it was on POV or something. It was a show on, you know, how the healthcare industry is leaving people abandoned and unable to pay their medical bills and, 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 and you know one of the examples and there's a, a guy who elected to have his foot cut off because the, the surgery to save it was going to be so expensive. I mean you know so full of horror stories. So this guy in the review accounts all of that and he said well the film never though addresses how are we going to pay for universal health care. Now to me I didn't write it because I've been so busy, but the letter I'd like to write back to that is probably too late now you have to get, fire these things off right away, is how can we not pay for it? And this is the sort of, this is, the, this is reason with emotion, you see? It's not, well, we'll pay for it by taking a little money here and a little money there. No, it's, 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 it's a value. It's how can we not pay for it? Exactly. I mean, it's not like there's no money anywhere. It's being spent on other things. Yeah, exactly. And how, how could we ever call ourselves human and not pay for this? No. In fact. Um, I, uh, I think it's really great to sort of look at it from, from in a retrospective kind of way and see where we were and see why it is that we ended up here. But I am going to be a teacher. One of my core values of uh, being an educator is teaching critical thinking 
and teaching my students to be good citizens. So, you know, like, it, it's really great to have this conversation, but where do we go from here? What do we tell our friends? And you, so you dressed it a little bit before, but I'm just wondering if you can get a little bit more. We need a new track. critical thinking a critical thinking based on the way people really reason, as opposed to one that's based on a false view. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and yeah. it's very important, I mean, you are absolutely right. You know, it's important that you teach your kids that. To teach your kids, you know, why people vote against their interests. To teach your kids to recognize frames when they're there. To understand how it's really working. Yeah. And by the way, I mean, we got a, I got a, we got a problem with Berkeley in the journalism school. I go over to occasionally lecture to the first year graduate students over there, and I start in, and within 10 minutes somebody asks me the question, this is uh, the opposite of what we're being taught. We're being taught, this is who, what, when, where, everything's literal. Words are neutral. Yeah. They're not neutral, right? One of the reasons for our media is that they're taught enlightenment reason, which says words are neutral. When I teach, um Writing, I, I, I teach privately, and, 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 and sometimes when a, a student is sort of lost in the work, one of the ways I help them, I think, where do you connect here? Where do you have strong feelings? It's the opposite of what people are often taught. They're going to, you know, ignore your own feelings. You're supposed to just, you know, think clearly. Your feelings will get in the way. It's, that's not, that's not the right, that's, that doesn't help people think, really, either. But how do you walk the line between being biased and... You know, and, and, and reasoning with passion. I would just get rid of the word bias and not worry about that. I would say, go with your passion and then find a way to support that passion why, and examine that passion and live with it and reflect with it. Ask questions of it yourself. You know, do you agree with yourself when you reflect for a minute? You, the next day, do you still agree with yourself? Start a whole dialogue with yourself. Don't worry about bias. Nobody can be without bias. Fairness is a better word. Are you being fair? And there's, a, there's another thing, just like what Susan was saying on the science side. You know, I have to do this as a cognitive scientist with views that I have. But I have to examine my own. You know, I go in here, and this is 50-50, an examination of, you know, what progressive views are and what conservative views are. You know, I have to examine my own views. I have to look at them fairly and really, really see if they're, you know, what, you know, what, what I'm valuing in all of these things. And that's not wrong. It doesn't mean you have to give them up. And in fact, it's because of empathy and caring that you have to do that. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. Kathleen? Self-reflection. There's often, if you if you encourage people to read themselves, you will find when I write something, and then sometimes I'll throw it out the next day because there's some way that I feel. It's almost a physical feeling. I feel profoundly uncomfortable with it, and so I keep looking and looking, and finally I find where it's where it's false, where it's not really authentic with my experience. A couple more. 